greatest equalizer in the world is that I know I can never fulfill that lady's fantasy about me. Wayne Newton performed 200 times a year. He finally weaned himself down to 50 times. You may find that hard to believe, but it's been said that Las Vegas without Wayne Newton would be like Disneyland without Mickey Mouse. Wayne Newton is the subject of tonight's personal story. He's something of a Vegas institution. He has legions of fans, but he's also something of a curiosity. For years, he's been the target of jokes about his weight, his high voice, and his goody-goody image. Nowadays, he has a black belt in karate, a temper to match, and a show that has him coming back again and again. <laughs> They come from Terre Haute and Tucson, Baltimore and Bangor, Altoona and Albuquerque. They come to spend a few woozy, sentimental hours awash in romance and fantasy. They are pilgrims, and over the years, 12 million of them have traveled Wayne Newton Highway for an audience with the midnight idol of Las Vegas. When ladies scream and throw panties or room keys or give me notes, the, the greatest equalizer in the world is that I know I can never fulfill that lady's fantasy about me. Wayne Newton holds court here 20 weeks a year, seven nights a week, two shows a night, and always, always to sell out crowds. He reportedly makes a million dollars a month every month he appears. I have never performed for money. Uh, the money has come along, thank God, but Part of what makes me happy is, uh, is going to work, not how much I'm going to get for working. Is Vegas enough for you? Uh, in terms of career? Yes. I remember one of the things I used to get a great deal uh, of flack about in reviews when I would go out on the road is uh, invariably they would say, uh, Newton does well in Vegas, but will he do well in Des Moines? Well, that's absurd. I mean, there's no greater com competitiveness in the world than this time. Wayne has been doing what he loves, performing since he was six. He made his first record, the 1964 novelty hit Don Cashane, when he was 21. He described himself then as a pudgy kid with a soprano voice. With your first hit, Don Cashane, you said you went to sleep thinking that you had a big hit on your hands and you woke up with the world thinking, you are a German girl. <laughs> it, it was more than just thinking. The first time I heard it played on, uh, on the radio uh, was a, an L.A. station. And the uh, announcer said, we've got a brand new record. It's done by a person by the name of Wayne Newton. And he said, I know that this is actually Margaret Whiting recording under a different name. So that's the first time I heard it on the air. And what did you think? It hurt my feelings. <laughs> After Don Cashane, the big time eluded Wayne until a certain Howard Hughes took a special interest in him. Hughes, it seems, kept a careful watch over the acts at the casinos he owned, and he appreciated Wayne's wholesome, patriotic, family-oriented show. Word got around town that the invisible godfather had taken Wayne under his wing, and Newton's luck changed. Quick as a roll of the dice, he was a headliner. I would have given up two or three years of my life to just hang around him. But meanwhile, Wayne became the butt of all those Wayne Newton jokes and Johnny Carson's monologues. Years ago when Johnny Carson made fun of you, you got very angry. You still mad at him? I don't, uh, and I don't mean this to sound any, any way other than the way I'm going to say it. He's not important enough in my life for me to be angry with him still. I wasn't fighting what he said. I was fighting his right to say it. He didn't know me well enough to say those things and have them be humor. But his biggest fight so far has been with NBC News. In 1980, NBC linked Newton with some unsavory organized crime type, and Newton sued for libel. It was a classic Vegas title bout. The battle dragged on round after round for nearly 10 years, but Wayne went the distance. This year, he agreed to a court settlement of almost $6 million. NBC is appealing, but Newton feels vindicated by what his attorney calls the largest libel award in history. It was uh, one of the most demanding times of my life. Would it have been better just to have let it drop and not to have gone through 10 years of that? If they had hit me at a place that I could have, I would have. Uh, but they hit me in the two areas that are not for sale. 
and that's my dignity and my honor. On the home front, he's engaged to marry actress Marla Heasley, but it's the spectacular stage show that will keep the pilgrims coming back. What does your audience take home? They, they see that I'm vulnerable. They see that I hurt. And if I hurt, I cry. And if you cut me, I bleed. And that I'm... Thank you for all the joy Wayne, Wayne brings to uh, Joe Butcher is a charm and an ease to the character. I'm trying to seduce him. Um, he's trying to seduce me, so it's sort of a game of cat and mouse. And he can do it in a number of ways. He can do it with his sense of humor, he can do it with his uh, charm, he can do it with songs. And let's love each other while the feelings go. What people say to me, do you, do you bet, I, only, I say only on myself. Uh, and I've never been to one of the tables in my life. I'm one of those people that I'm terribly optimistic. Um, I, you know, the kind of guy that took a, his last dollar and bought a wallet with it. You know, uh, I don't like bad news. Nobody likes bad news. I also try not to cross bridges before I get to them. And I feel that when it's time to be sad, that's soon enough. Because it's real. So I try not to make a lot of sadness for others as well as myself. Okay, and again. Rebuilt stone for stone to all its original work. That's a joke for you. You want me to cross? You want to go I have had three things in my life. A great faith in the man upstairs. A great faith in, in the public and the ability to just kind of pull back my energies when I feel I'm getting close to the burnout and go sit down somewhere and let the chips fall where they may. In this edition of Cover Story with entertainer Wayne Newton, we went to Las Vegas and joined Wayne at his Casa de Shenandoah, just outside town, where he shared with us the journey that brought him here from his Roanoke, Virginia birthplace and what it's like being a full-time single father for his daughter, Erin. Succeeding Elvis Presley at the Las Vegas Hilton as the premier attraction year after year didn't come easy. Wayne Newton started out professionally on the Grand Ole Opry radio show when he was six years old. But Wayne's asthma forced his parents to move the family to Arizona when he was 10. There, he continued to sing, and by 1963, Wayne Newton had his first hit record, Donk of Shame. Now, 25 years later, Wayne has made more than 80 albums and entertained more than 12 million people all over the world. Wayne's acting career has included appearances in such hit TV shows as Vegas and won him critical acclaim for his role in North and South Book Two. In Mexico City, Wayne just completed a co-starring role in the latest James Bond film, License to Kill. And now, we're going to find out what's really important for this second son of two Native American Indians who was chosen one of the 10 outstanding young men in America by the National Junior Chamber of Commerce. For Wayne Newton, the boy who dared to live the American dream. Nobody thinks of Wayne Newton with country music, when in fact that's how I started. Uh, in Virginia, I mean, there was nothing I ever heard but country music, and that's what I started with and what I sang. Nobody in my family on either side uh, had ever been in show business. Uh, my mother's family 
uh, around the house played guitars and fiddles and that kind of thing. But as far as just plain deciding to to be a singer, that came about one night when I was four years old. My parents took me to see a Grand Ole Opry road show that had come through Roanoke, Virginia. I decided that night that that's what I wanted to do. I kept begging my parents to give me music lessons, and I think my dad was making like $48 a week, and uh, six of that went for the music lessons and the rental of the instruments. And uh, so we both started at the same time. Because my brother was older, he got the, the rhythm guitar, which is really what I wanted to play. And uh, because I was younger, I had to take the steel guitar, of course, which I've never regretted. Take you down out of the closet Put it on, that's why I thought it Come stand in front of me And let me see and WDBJ had a 6, 6 a.m. radio show and had seen me uh, sing at a, at a used to have things in Virginia called uh, Community Sings, uh, where on the Sundays they would be out in the park and all the young aspiring uh, singers and uh, performers would go there. And uh, and so this group had seen me and asked me to come on their radio show, and I became a regular. And uh, so I just, I had a local radio show when I was six before going to school, a local television show when I was 12 for four years in Phoenix, Arizona. So I've literally been working my whole life. Take the warm smile that you wear. Place it on these lips that's burning. To share the smile you built inside of me. An agent uh, saw me in Phoenix and uh, called my parents to ask if we'd be interested in uh, auditioning in Las Vegas. Drove to Las Vegas. Auditioned at the Fremont, got the job. Out of the first year, I think we spent 46 weeks at the Fremont. And my voice changed the first time <laughs> when I was about 16 and a half. When I was at the Fremont, and all voice teachers will tell you when your voice starts to change, the first thing you should do is not sing because of the obvious changes that are going on uh, physiologically. Well, I couldn't not sing, because we were doing six shows a night, a duet, six shows a night, uh, six nights a week, and that went on for five years. <laughs> we have been together, believe it or not, going on 20 long, miserable years. <laughs> Mr. Don, Mr. Lady, uh, I've seen him uh, come a long way, I guess, but he always had that innate ability to entertain, and uh, that's something you can't uh, give to a person. Uh, he was always able to do that. He could do it with uh, almost any kind of music that he wanted to, and I, um, I found it a very fascinating life with him. I always felt that I could truly be whatever I wanted to be, but the level of success that I achieved at it was excuse me, not the criteria. In other words, I never said by the time I'm this age, I'm going to accomplish this and I'm going to have this. I would never be a slave to this. To reach the unreachable Mr. Benny, Jack Benny, was in Australia on a tour. And he came and see my show. And he invited me to see his show in a theater in Sydney. And we went backstage and he said to me, uh, would you consider working with me? I said, consider it? <laughs> where, you, where would you like me and when? And uh, the first place we worked was Harris in Lake Tahoe. And I said to him when he told me that was going to be the first engagement, I said, well, Mr. Mr. Benny, I think you should know, because I don't, I don't like 
these kind of surprises for myself, and I wouldn't want you to have them. I said, they don't want me at Harris, not in the main room. I said, I played the lounge there for years, and, uh, and they refused to, to book me in there. And he said, if they don't want you, they don't want me. We went into Harris. And uh, so I played, I believe, three engagements with Mr. Benny and Harris. And then my first engagement headlining was the Flamingo as a result of, of that show. We opened, I believe it was on the 18th of November in 1964. And the place was packed, but with all locals. All those people that had seen me for those years at the Fremont came out. We broke all existing records for the Flamingo in attendance for that particular engagement. The thought of party smacks you in the town. All the sweet rain I sang. The window. Someone left the cake out of the rain. I didn't think that I could take it because it took so long to bake. And I'll never have that recipe. talk to me about Las Vegas, there's, there's no place like this in the world, nor are there any people in the world quite like these people that live here. It's been an incredible town to me from that aspect. Uh, the locals have supported me tremendously. I found them more likable all the time, you know, and um, I, uh, naturally working with them all these years, uh, kind of speaks for itself. He's just a wonderful guy, and... Uh, He's made it very interesting for me and for anyone that's up on that stage with him. Every southern boy, I think, always has wanted a plantation. So because of my health, I couldn't live in the south uh, because of bronchial asthma. And so we moved from the south when I was 10 years old to Arizona. And yet I still had this dream of uh, owning a plantation. So when I built this, I, I felt that a, a plantation wouldn't look right in the middle of the desert either. So I just tacked on the Spanish name Casa de, and still call it the Shenandoah. So I think that this is my, my answer to uh, <laughs> my desert plantation. I can come home at night and walk around the ranch and mess with the flamingos or fool with the penguins. And they don't have to do anything for me. I mean, they don't have to do tricks, and they don't... Uh, as you can see, almost everything r runs wild. We must have over a hundred peacocks. Uh, I've been blessed, and these are the things that uh, that truly please me. And uh, one walk around the ranch is equivalent to having a week off. I've had two pensions in life. One was music. The other was horses. And I didn't honestly know which came first when I was younger. I can tell you which afforded the other. I have had such a love of horses my entire life. And I have always wanted the prettiest black horse in the world. The good Lord has blessed me tremendously. Uh, I have owned truly some of the most magnificent horses that ever took a breath of air. We have, uh, as one of the top five herds in the world, we have imported horses from all over the world and we have exported horses all over the world. I, I plan the entire breeding program. I name every foal. And I do the foaling myself. We have had over 600 foals born here at the Shenandoah and have never lost one at birth. Um, there's, it's, it's been a great equalizer for me. Whenever I started to feel like I was a little too important for my own good, uh, invariably I would come home and have a, a baby sick or a, a mare that I had to stay in the stall with for, you know, 36 hours. But that's not uncommon. Sure, I have people now that, that can and, and do that, but I still do it. And uh, it just makes me realize that, uh, that uh, I'm not much. And I, I really mean that. I, I'm, I, I love cars, I'm, and, and they're art to me. But each car has a, a particular significance to me also. The, the roles that I drive, 
was Bill Harris' personal car. Uh, the Stutz Bearcat was made for Elvis, who was a very dear friend. One of the Clinets belonged to a very dear friend who died much too soon, Marvin Gaye. And that was left to me. The 59 Rolls was my first Rolls Royce and, my, and still my favorite. There's a Duesenberg out there that I would be uh, certainly remiss if I didn't mention that would belong to Howard Hughes. Daddy, don't you walk so fast. She is, uh, she's my reason for waking up in the morning. And uh, there isn't anything I wouldn't do for her. And she's, I have been through things with her that, forget being a single father, just being a father. But then being a single father is really doing something. Daddy, don't you want so I generally get home around 3 or 4 in the morning. I'm up at 7. I take my daughter to school and make any phone calls that I have to make and deal with any emergencies of the day. Pick my daughter up again at 2.30 from school. And then we try to spend an hour, an hour and a half together, uh, whether it be riding a horse or watching television, it doesn't matter. And uh, at 5 o'clock, I shower and shave have dinner at 5.30, uh, finish that at 6.30, and change and go to work, and I'm there by 7, and on stage at 8. Could this whole thing burn down tomorrow, and all the cars were gone, and and the horses were gone, I'd probably find myself a little bird out there with a broken wing and I'd be nursing it and then taking a stray cat and a dog that doesn't have a home and I'd go on. I, it, this I built and I could build it again. <laughs> There were 